Acts 11. We're going to pick up in verse 19. Kind of remind us where we've been. <clears throat> what we were looking at. We are looking at Barnabas the exhorter. And then we got into what discipleship was. But we're jumping back into the book of Acts now. Acts chapter 11 verse 19. The Bible says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, <clears throat> when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that was with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Father, I pray that you would use me, speak through me. I pray your word would help us, guide us, direct us, and we can learn from it. Please, Lord, just fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, <clears throat> we see that there was a persecution that came after the martyrdom of Stephen. And it was through that, you know, when we look back through the book of Acts and the great commissions given, and what does God tell his churches to do? We just finished studying the Great Commission. So what does he tell them to do? What's that? That's it. He told them to go, right? He said, go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the, the first command is just go. I want you just going. What do they do? They stay. They stay. They don't go. They stay. <clears throat> and then what does he do? Well, he says, well, I'm going to help you. I'm going to motivate you to obey me. And persecution comes. And they scatter abroad because of the persecution. So he gets them going out. And now as they go out, it says that they traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. So they get out there and people begin to hear what's going on. The hand of the Lord is with them. It says there in Antioch, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And tidings of these things come unto the ears of the church, right? The, the church in Jerusalem heard what's going on. They say, wow, there's something happening over there. So they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Barnabas, we're going to send you out there. We want you to find out what's going on to help them. Help these people come let us know what's going on. And he gets there and he sees the grace of God. He exhorts them. And with, pur the, with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. So just keep serving God. Keep doing what you're doing. And I'm here to help you. It says he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was filled with faith. And as he goes there to help them, it says much people was added unto the Lord. So then people are getting saved and people are getting baptized. He establishes that church there. That's what they sent him to do there. Establish those churches, establish those people. And Barnabas had never forgotten about a man named Saul. And Barnabas says, Saul came out this way. Let me go find him. So he departs to Tarsus to seek Saul. And he finds him and brings him back to Antioch. And they stay there for a year. And they become two of the pastors of that church. <clears throat> and then it says, that's what's going on. That's what's happening right there. Now, if you remember, we're going to go back a little bit to Acts chapter 10. Does anybody remember what happens in Acts chapter 10 with Peter? Is it? No. 
something else happens. Exactly. The vision of the sheet comes down, and there's all manner of four-footed beasts, right? And God tells him, hey, Peter, slay and eat. And he says, not so, Lord. I haven't eaten anything unclean in <clears throat> my whole life, basically. And God tells him in the vision, he says, what God hath cleansed, call not thou unclean. It's clean. I've cleansed it. Go ahead. Happens three times. Peter's arguing with the Lord about it. And then finally, they come up and tell him, hey, three men seek thee. And guess what? It's three Gentiles. Three Gentiles are representing Cornelius. And Paul deciphers, hey, the Lord's in this thing, but God wants me to go to these, this Gentile and help this man. And he goes and he preaches the gospel to them and they get saved. And then he comes back and tells everyone in Jerusalem what had happened. And they're kind of, they don't believe it. They say, no, 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 that's not what happened. That's not, that can't happen. God doesn't work like that. And he says, yeah, he does. He did. He saved them just like he saved us. They spoke with tongues just like we did. God's opening their eyes a little bit at a time because they're just as hard hearted as we can be. They're just as stubborn as we can be. They don't want to see God at work in a way that they haven't approved of. So they're having a hard time with some of this, what's going on here. And when we get to Acts chapter 11, and we see that, hey, they hear, hey, they went out to Antioch and whatnot, and, and people are getting saved, and then Barnabas heads out there, and it's like, whoa, what's going on here? They, he wants to go out there. They want to send people out to see what's going on. In verse 27, and in these days came... Prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch. See, they're they're checking out what's going on. <clears throat> they have prejudices back then just like we do today. Okay, they're, they're people just like we are. And they had problems and they didn't understand everything. And this is, if you were a Jew, this whole thing is flipping your world upside down. Okay, this is not normal. To us, it's normal. We're like, what's the big deal? Not to a Jew, though. This is, no, we can't do that. Like, they're having a real internal struggle with this. This is quite a change that they are not ready for. And, and it was hard for them. It was hard for them to understand it. So we can't knock them too much when it's what they've grown up with their whole life. And now they're having to adjust. And it's something different and new. And so that's what's happening. So they, they hear what's going on, and they're like, well, we need to send people to check out what's actually happening. And so they end up doing that. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And what I want us to look at here is fellowships, fellowship amongst the Lord's churches. There's a bunch of truths we're going to learn, but that's really kind of where I want to focus is what should fellowship be amongst the Lord's churches? Sadly, there is a tendency among some of God's people to only look for the wrong that people do. Okay, that's been God's people... From well, that's not even God's people. That's just people in general are always going to look for what's different from them. Okay, but there we're going to focus in on this right here. There's a tendency among some of God's people to only look for what's wrong. To only look for the wrong in people. That is a cancer that can destroy an individual, a family, or a church. Okay, if you're only looking for what's wrong in people, and I promise you. If you do that, you're going to find it. You will find it. You are going to find in people something that they do that's wrong, that's sinful, that you don't agree with. You will find it. Promise, every single time. Every single time you'll find it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, who knows what the theme of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is? Charity. The theme of 1 Corinthians 13 is charity. We would say biblical love. Okay, it's basically giving all to God. Biblical love. Loving like God loves. Okay, he gave his only begotten son. That's love. Okay, it says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and then get this, and there's more that could be said about it, but I wanted to get to this. 
it's talking about charity, and it says, Charity thinketh no evil. Charity doesn't think evil of people. It doesn't do that. It's not always looking for the wrong. Charity does not do that. There is going to be no fellowship with other people if all we look for is where we disagree. Okay? I guarantee you're gonna they'll, we can make it so there's zero fellowship with anybody in your personal life, in our church life, if all we look for is where we disagree. Even here, we can get all divided up if we look at just the things we, we're different on or we don't agree with somebody. Now, in a church, it's a little different. We do There need, does need to be unity within a church, but that's a message for another time. We do need to be on the same page on most things within a church. But a church somewhere else that doesn't do things like we do doesn't mean they're wrong. And it doesn't necessarily mean we're right. It could be we're both right or we're both wrong. But I'm talking about maybe the methods or the ways that people do things. Another church does something. That's, that's what's going on here. And, and again, I already talked about it. The, the, they're saying, well, I don't know if these Gentiles can get saved. They're having a real hard time with it. Or how are they getting saved exactly? And I'll talk about some more of that in a bit as we get through more of this in the next probably week or two. So from this interaction between the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch, we can clearly see that God wants His churches in fellowship with one another. Let me say that again. God wants His churches in fellowship with one another. Okay, to some degree. Right, clearly it wasn't that often, but He definitely wants them in fellowship. Why? Because we're all members of His kingdom. We're all outposts or embassies of His the same kingdom. We serve the same king. But what we do here doesn't mean that everyone everywhere has to do it the way we do it here. They can do things differently. We can even disagree on things and still be fine with each other because that's how you guys want to do it. Here's how we want to do it. And again, within this church, we need to be in unity. And in, in their church, they need to be in unity. We ought to fellowship and even support those that don't do things exactly like us or even agree with how we do every little thing and vice versa. We need to fellowship and even support those that don't do things just like us or even agree with how we do every little thing. And vice versa, we need to be the same way with them. We have a responsibility before God to work together for the furtherance of the gospel. We have a responsibility. Again, we're all part of the same kingdom. We're all ultimately working towards the same goal. So we need to work with those that are like-minded. We need to encourage those that are like-minded. Now let me back up here. Because we want to work with those that are like-minded those that are of Baptist faith, okay? Because those are the embassies of the kingdom. There is a such thing as ecclesiastical separation. Ecclesiastical separation. Ecclesiastical means the, the church. Because everything that calls itself a church is not a church. So we want to work with true New Testament churches. And I'm not saying everything out there that calls itself a church doesn't do some good things. I'm not saying they don't see people saved. But our intent is to work with churches. That's what we see happening here. 
Okay, that's what we see happening. Churches working together. New Testament churches working together. And that's what we want to do. We're to earnestly contend for the faith. Okay, so just everything out there. There's so much that could be said about this. <clears throat> Our focus and priority ought to be this New Testament church. Not some other ministry out there. Everything's a ministry out there, and it's all without authority. Most everything that's out there is without any authority. It's just someone decides, I want to do this, and they're Lone Ranger. Maybe they've even built it into something big. So we need to be careful what we support. Really, your first support needs to be here at this church. Anybody's first support needs to be the ch at, a, at the church they're a part of. That's where their support needs to be. But again, we have a responsibility before God to work together for the furtherance of the gospel. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation, that means your lifestyle, your testimony, your manner of life, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. I guess God cares what our testimony is. Right? It makes sense, doesn't it? He says, Let your testimony be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, look at this, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. I understand he's writing to a specific church. I get that. We're striving together for the faith of the gospel. In another New Testament church, we can strive together with them as well for the faith of the gospel where it fits that's what we do in missions that's what missions is you're striving together for the faith of the gospel with another church because maybe they've prepared some man so that he can go and be a missionary maybe it's a Barnabas and Paul well, the church prepared them sent them but others gave to them to support that for the faith of the gospel. We have a responsibility before God. We as churches are outposts of His kingdom and have a responsibility to further His agenda, not our own. And we want to work together. We want to work together where we can, when we can, as we can. And we need to do it by faith. We need to do it by faith. And that's missions is, is faith. We start supporting missions. We do it by faith. We're going to give by faith. And there's an offering taken. We read about it in Acts chapter 11. Towards the end, there was an offering taken. And we're going to talk about that. About how did they give. Now remember, I've been talking about the special offering we're going to take, right? I said it's a free will offering. What, what is your tithe? Is your tithe giving? Anybody is the tithe giving? No, it's not giving, right? Why? Because the tithe, the Bible says, belongs to the Lord. The tithe is the Lord's. It's already His. So that's not giving. You're not giving until you give above that 10%. Then you're giving. That's really where the faith comes in. Okay, that's what a free will offering is. It's above that. It's above the tithe. The tithe already belongs to God. A free will offering is, okay, we're going to give to missions. And we want to help this missionary get to the mission field. That's striving together with another church for the faith of the gospel. That's what that's doing. That's us giving here so that they can go there. Remember in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says that we're to, to, to uh, let me turn there and look because I'm going to butcher it if I, if I don't look. So you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of all the earth. Okay, <clears throat> so he says, you're going to be a witness unto me both. Well, guess what? We can only be right here. 
We can't be somewhere else. How can we be somewhere else? By sending someone in our stead. By sending somebody in our place. Someone else to go reach those we can't. That's what we want to do. We've got to do it by faith. We have to ask God and trust God and, and not look at, at, at what we in our power can do, but we need to start looking to trusting what God can do through us. That's fellowship amongst the Lord's churches. That's what we want to be a part of. That's fruit that will abound to our account, but it comes because we're working with other churches. Churches that are like-minded, but maybe don't even practice everything the way we do. They have different policies in place to follow the Bible. A lot of them will be the same. Some might be a little different. That's okay. Because that's them. This is us. We can do things differently. The Bible's very open. Do you know some people will freak out about this, but do you know the Bible doesn't say you have to meet on Sundays? I challenge anybody to show me where the Bible says you have to meet on Sundays. It does not. It does not. That's a tradition we follow, but it doesn't say you have to meet on Sunday. I think it's biblically derived because we can see the, the early church met on Sundays, the first day of the week, and that's where we get the practice from. But nowhere in the Bible does it declare that you have to meet on Sunday. A church doesn't have to meet on Sunday if they don't want. They don't have to have a midweek service if they don't want. I think at the very least, a church should have a Sunday service and, and a midweek service if they're to really raise up disciples. But that's in these circumstances. If we were in a country where there was persecution and we can't openly meet, that's probably going to change because you open yourself up to arrest and everything else and that, that legitimate persecution that can come on you because you're being together more often. So circumstances change everything. I think a church should, in America, you should meet on Sundays. In most places in the world, you could probably meet on Sundays. Other places, you might not be able to. I know that there's people that have tried to mandate that it has to be on Saturday. They said the Sabbath. I can tear that apart with the Bible. That's not the point of what I'm doing right now, so I'm not going to. But I could. No, you don't. A church can if they want to, but they don't have to. So we may do things different, but it doesn't mean we're wrong. One church may decide we're going to meet on Saturdays. Another church says we're going to meet on Sundays. Doesn't mean the church that meets on Saturdays is wrong. Doesn't mean the one that meets on Sundays is wrong or that one's more right because God didn't declare it. So God gives leeway within his word on how we do things, how we practice things. There's nothing. The Bible says nothing about having a, a Friday night Bible study. It says nothing about that. But do you know what it does say? It says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's another opportunity to obey the Great Commission. That's one way we as a church have decided to let's teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. We're going to have a, a Bible study on, on Fridays. We're going to have a midweek Bible study. We're going to have preaching on, on Sundays. This is how we've decided to do it. Other churches do it differently. We have a Sunday afternoon. So most churches that we fellowship with have a Sunday night service. But none of it's mandated. See, we can do things a little bit differently as long as we're in line with the Word of God. And none of that is outside of the scope of what God says to do. I think in America, you'd be crazy not to have a service on Sunday because Americans still are used to you go to church on Sunday because we are a, you know, Judeo-Christian society. And that's always been how it's been here in America. You meet on Sunday. And so that's just natural. People just think that. You'd be crazy not to have a service on Sunday, in my opinion. But hey, if a church doesn't want to, they don't have to. I'm just saying that if you look long enough at an individual, 
at a church, you're guaranteed to find problems. You will find problems. So let's try to exemplify 1 Corinthians 13, where biblical charity is. And look at people like that. Let's try and be that. It'd be less gossip, less envy, less hatred of here, of us out there, if we followed what the Bible said. Let me just read this again real quickly. This isn't even the full description of it. But it says, charity suffereth long. It suffers long. It's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Think about that. It behaves properly. In every circumstance, it behaves properly. Seeketh not her own. It's not about me first. Is not easily provoked. I don't get provoked to, to wrath, to anger, to jealousy, to whatever. And thinketh no evil. It doesn't think evil. Let's start living like that. Especially as we think of other churches, other Christians. Let's start being like that. If someone always has something negative to say to you, how, how often do you want to be around them? If you know you're like, man, they're going to say something about me. They're going to say something negative. How often do you want to be around them? You, you don't, right? Very little. You're like, ah, you see that person. You're like, yeah. You're like walking down and you see them. You're like, oh, okay. You do one of those, right? You're like, let me go this way. You know, I'll go the long way. And I don't want to talk to them. Right? Let's not be like that. Now there there is a time when we hey we want to, we stand on the truth. Okay, we're going to stand on the truth, and sometimes that means you, that harsh things need to be said at times. The, the truth is harsh sometimes. It, none of what I'm saying here means we compromise. We don't compromise what we believe. But I will say this: that charity suffereth long. You don't have to prove you're right right now. You don't have to prove that you're right and they're wrong right now. Give people grace to grow. We need to give people grace to grow. And churches, just because they do something wrong, maybe they don't understand the Bible as we do. Maybe there's things we're doing wrong because we don't understand the Bible as they do. Let's just give people grace. I mean, God hasn't struck any of you dead yet, has he? No, then he's, he's giving you a lot of grace, isn't he? Because how much stuff do you know that you do wrong? You know for a fact you're doing it wrong. And God hasn't struck you dead. Right? Aren't, aren't you glad? Yeah, like thank God for that, right? Thank God for that. So let's go and do likewise. Let's try and be like our Savior. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Pray that you just help us as we go about serving you this week, Lord. Help us to exemplify charity. Lord, and to have soft hearts and to really desire to, to help people, to help them to grow, to model godly, holy Christian living, set the example for them, that our conversation would be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Please, Lord, help us to live holy, godly lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.